heaven on this day, Saul in cancer, and Una waxing in cancer. Greetings at the solstice. In the... Welcome to another round of Christian Mass. Let us adore together the Bayoun deity, the Father, Mother, God, who in unity formulates the golden and magical child, the eld, archetype, and hologram of the human race. Nature is a system of nuptials and gives us the language of spirit by the love of the goddess leading us on to the divine life. The crown of immortality for us is in the power of godhood and the kingdom of love wherein the heart dwells. And here we adore the Bayoun God in its unity and in love. Love is our essence and our nature. It tinctures the pure expression of the will. In honor of this nameless God, with the love of the goddess, by the zeal of our spiritual aspiration, are we able to see the soul unveiled that we might know each other in the light, in beauty, truth, and love, and by way of the essence that is the pure will in each of us, do we in peace and harmony also adore this golden and magical child of the Bayoun God. We must always endeavor to seek light through the strife of contending forces. Rejoice, therefore, that through their trials thou shalt triumph. The Master said, Blessed art thou. Yet, O Asperus, let thy victories be in that serenity. With the increase of gnosis should come the increase of wisdom. Be sure that thy soul is steadfast. Fear is failure, and the forerunner of failure, and courage is the beginning of virtue. Therefore, fear not the spirits, but be firm and courageous. We are what we make of ourselves, our actions affecting each ourselves and also the entire universe. Worship it if it not the physical body, it is a temporary connection to the body and the material world. Knowledge of the heart starts by strengthening and controlling the animal passions and by disciplining both the emotions and the reason. Strive ever to nourish the higher aspirations. Verily in heart do we good unto others for its own sake and not for any gratuity. We must ever act passionately, think rationally, and each must be thyself. Truly also, have the greatest self respect and accumulate virtue in all that you do. Virtue is a prayer with the holiness. The material act is but the outward expression of our thoughts. We must strive ever to the control of thought and the fixity of our intent. Establish yourself firmly in the equilibrium of fortress, and instead of the cross of the elements, the earliest cross from whose head the fate of the word issues. Therefore must we be prompt and active as the sylphs, avoiding frivolity and caprice. We must be energetic and strong like the salamanders, avoiding irritability and ferocity. Also we must be flexible and attentive to images like the undines, avoiding idleness and changeability. And finally, we should be laborious and patient like the gnomes, avoiding grossness and avarice. In true religion, there is no sect. Therefore, Take heed that thou wast seen, not to gain that which nothing will destroy. First thou do this in Jupiter, thou wilt thus gain the Hova. And in Osiris, Yeshua, ask and you shall have, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Good afternoon again, and welcome to another Rosicrucian Mass. Uh, today's sermon is entitled Sacred Space. We're going to talk about sacred space. Sacred space has four unique dimensions, inner, outer, above and below, and then, of course, the four uh, directions on earth. Inner space is the space of your mind and body, and that becomes you know, an essential place to start. Uh, the body has been called the temple of the Holy Ghost. But if we're creating this personality, 
the, the, the mind issue and the body issue become very, very interesting because the body needs to receive the divine inspiration that comes from the mind. And so the body must be healthy. Health issues include the food we eat, the air we breathe, smoking, all sorts of uh, things. Uh, now, there is some complexity in some of the habits we have as human beings. Uh, smoking being one of those complex habits that we can have that are enjoyable. And sometimes we take our enjoyments at, with, at risk. Alcohol and, and other things that we might imbibe can have health consequences. We're trading those consequences for something else. So that has to be worked out. We can't create any kind of general standard for that. That has to be worked out by each individual. Um, the mind can be likened to a field with its own real estate as well, even though the mind is not physical per se. It's its connection to the brain and being the rationale for our physical health. Okay, but the mind has its own dimension. The terrain of the psyche, as we would call it, is what builds personality. And you know, it's been divided into right and left brain functions, as well as conscious and subconscious functions. So we have to take a look at that and uh, begin to really map these internal regions. The Western mystery tradition divides this map into the Ruach and assigns the seven major aspects of the psyche called the seven planetary spirits. Now, outer space would comprise of the social dynamic, because that's the mind extended outwards. That's our society, our family, and those of our kin or clan, our extended family. Uh, now, cults tend to bring an exacerbated awareness of kin and clan and can create something that gets out of balance. Thus, we have dangerous gangs and vicious cults of all sorts today. But the kin or the clan is an extended identification of ourselves, and we must try to keep that to something wholesome, which is not necessarily limited to blood, that, you know, I'm related to a certain family by blood. But that can be one aspect of it, and again, we just can't over-exaggerate that. The above and below tend to go together. Uh, in traditional religion, God represents the above, and it's his will that needs to be done on earth. Okay, now, for magic, that's, you know, taken altogether differently because the, the major's job is to unite heaven and earth. Whether that's God with material things, you know, bringing the spirit into matter, or some other arrangement that I'm, I'm sure some people might be comfortable with, philosophically. Uh, the ancient Egyptians, their main god was Osiris, who was equivalent to Jesus today, and, and the Jesus of our churches today, in that um, he judged the living and the dead. However, also, um, Osiris meant so much more. Osiris was mapped in the sky. Uh, pyramids were placed on the ground because of that map. So that, that, that would be directly overhead on certain uh, days of the year, etc. Um, it also, with the Pharaoh, delivered us that concept that would go into medieval times, the, the king and his country are one. And so that maps the land itself as a holy and sacred space. But of course, if we dwell in that land, then we dwell in that sacred space. So I'm just giving you various ways that, that people have looked at sacred space over time. For the Gnostics, uh, you know, the outer and the above also hold sacred places that deliver in us or to us and evoke from us this sense of awe. And I think that's what becomes really important. The outer and the above also hold sacred places that deliver to us or evoke in us a sense of awe. Certainly, the archetypes of the psyche play into this sense of awe. Um, the archetype 
of the self delivers to us gods, you know, you know gods of love, pantheons, as much as individual gods portray the various roles we play in this world. So we, these larger um, non-monotheistic or polytheistic uh, world, especially in ancient Egypt, had every aspect of life, you know, was divine. So that this sense of sacred place was evolving. Um, today we, we tend to, to file that down to sacred spaces. Churches and temples certainly become sacred spaces. Um, you know, a, a, a small field, a room with an altar for somebody who prays or, or meditates or practices magic at home. Um, we have sacred spaces that we all revere, especially uh, mountains and rivers throughout history. Seven sacred mountains, seven sacred rivers. Uh, always connected with the number seven, which Blavatsky talks about pretty well in her writings. Um, these archetypes then also get extended onto the map of the heavens. The constellations of the stars start telling us a mystical story. So even the very sky surrounds us in sacred space. You know, and you know, everything that came out of the ancient Egyptians echoed in through the Greco-Roman myths, you know, and, and touched the, the ancient Gnostics. You know, the North Star having moved in 69 BC, even gave rise to the Gnostics and, and the Demiurge, because that one solid God was shown not to be the center of the universe. So that represented a breakdown and a realignment, a recapitulation of what sacred space is. And today we're kind of doing that again. Sacred space is not necessarily the space created inside your Christian church anymore. And we're saying that needs to be recalibrated somehow. All of what has been elucidated here leads to one important factor in the psyche that leads us to a direct perception of the divine. And that is this sense of awe again, that is evoked, you know, in contemplating sacred space. So what does that mean to be evoked in contemplating sacred space? Simply that, to sit out in a chair in the night sky and look at the stars and see the awe and wonder of it, and just to feel that sense. You're putting yourself in sacred space. You're having a wonderful, prayerful experience. You know, such space, whether it's the sanctuary of the Gnosis here in our church, or that night sky from your backyard, or even a secret grove or a favorite camping spot, all of these, you know, evoke that wonderfully unique human feeling. You know, and let's not forget the campfire itself at the campsite. Uh, for me, personally, as a child, that was Herman Hess. Uh, his novel, Demian, really woke me up, a young boy staring at a campfire, which is something I love to do, uh, as in those days also I was a boy scout, and I went camping third weekend every month. So I loved spending the night staring at that fire. That's what camping was all about for me. This awe, this sense of awe, is an irrational feeling, you know. It, it's a sense of holiness. It you know, brings on the contemplation and rumination of the divine. You know, and through this, we can find the divine directly in the world. We can find the divine in the sky and marry earth and heaven by finding it also in ourselves. And I think that's the ultimate key to Gnosis. So thanks for listening. We'll move to the a Eucharist of the Five Elements, and continue with the Mass.
For Osiris on offers who is found perfect before the gods hath said, These are the elements of my body, perfected through suffering, glorified through trial. For the scent of the dying roses as the repressed side of my suffering, and the flame red fire is the energy of mine undaunted will. And the cup of wine is the pouring out of the blood of my heart, sacrificed unto regeneration, unto the newer life. The bread is the foundation of my body, which I transform readily, that it may be renewed. For I am Osiris triumphant, even Osiris on offers the justifying. I am he who is clothed with the body of flesh, yet in whom is the spirit of the great gods. I am the Lord of life triumphant over death. He who partaketh with me shall arise with me. I am the manifester in matter of those whose abode is in the invisible. I am purified. I stand upon the universe. I am its reconciler with the eternal gods. I am the perfecter of matter, and without me the universe is not. I am come in the power of the light. I am come in the mercy of the light. I am come in the light of wisdom. The light hath healing in its wings. Blessed be thou, Lord of the universe, for thy glory flows out to the ends of the universe rejoicing. Through thirty ethers I summon the forces of the universe in myself. I inhale the perfume of the rose, for the air is the sweetness of life. I feel the warmth of the sacred lamp, the fire of my very own spirit. I taste this cake of light to nourish the foundation of my renewed body. I drink this wine that the body become infused with spirit. Finally, the ringing of the bell enchants my soul unto the city of the pyramids. Behold the doctrine of the four yaws, integrity. The integral man and woman seeks always to do that which is benevolent, yearning to do that which is right. That prospering prophet, he or she dedicates him or herself to what is good. Without pressure from others, he or she redresses his or her errors. Good deeds are accumulated as it is known that they will be sufficient to create character in us. 
If bad deeds are not accumulated, they will not be sufficient to disrupt our lives. The petty man or woman thinks that small good deeds are unimportant and does not do them. He or she thinks that small bad deeds are unimportant and does not abstain from them. Thus his or her evil accumulates until it can no longer be disguised, and his or her unconscious guilt grows until it can no longer be suppressed. The noble man or woman strives to harvest virtue in all its forms. Intent. Intent is not a thought or an object or a wish. Intent is what can make a man or woman succeed when his or her thoughts say that she or he is defeated. It operates in spite of one's self-indulgence and generates invulnerability and impeccability. He or she then walks the path with heart and waits for an opening to freedom. Sufficient personal power leads to the mastery of intent. Our reality is completely and entirely based upon our intent. It is a sign of considerable advance when a man begins to be moved by the will, by his own energy self-determined instead of being moved by desire by a response to an external attraction or repulsion. Intent, intent creates your reality. What are you intending for yourself? You can recognize it by listening to your real wishes, the ones with emotional buttons on them, the wishes that make you cry or scare you enough to make you cringe or bring a huge smile across your face just thinking about them. They are very deep inside, and they are the force that moves you in this life. Intelligence. All matter is alive and in its own way is intelligent. Matter is made manifest by its rate of vibration. The frequency of vibration in matter and its density provide for us a key to the level of consciousness indwelling any being or adept. Its rate of vibration shows us the degree of its intelligence. Nothing is dead or inanimate in nature. Everything exists in some degree of animation. Everything is alive and in its own way is an expression of universal mind. Only this all-pervading consciousness and intelligence is expressed in a different way in all the diverse beings made manifest. The degree of consciousness in any one thing corresponds to the degree of its density or the speed of its vibrations. The more dense the matter, the less conscious it is and the less intelligent. In our bodies, we must strive, eh, strive to raise the rate of vibration of our flesh. As we know, the flesh contributes to the quality of thought in our brain. Also, the greater rate vibration of any particular being, the more conscious and the more intelligent the matter. Hence, intelligence is related to adaptation. The more intelligent an individual, the better able he or she is to adapt to the circumstances of life. He or she then learns to accept the world as it is and is not confounded by finding it not to be what he or she might want it to be. Intuition. Every one of us possesses the faculty of the interior sense that is known by the name of intuition. But how rare are those who know how to develop it? It is, however, not only by the aid of this faculty that men can ever see things in their true colors. It is an instinct of the soul which grows in us in proportion to the employment we give it, and which helps us to perceive and understand the realities of things with far more certainty than, can, than in the simple use of our senses and the exercise of our reason. What are called good sense and logic enable us to see only the appearance of things, that which is evident to everyone. The instinct spoken here being a projection of our perceptive consciousness, a projection which acts from the subjective to the objective, and not vice versa, awakens in us spiritual senses and power to act. These senses assimilate to themselves the essence of the object or of the action under examination, and represent it to us as it really is, not as it appears to our physical senses and to our cold reason. In the words of Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, we begin with instinct, we end with omniscience. So with that, the Lord bless you, the Lord enlighten your minds and comfort your hearts and sustain your bodies. The Lord bring you to the accomplishment of the pure will, the great work, the summum bonum, true wisdom, and perfect.